Do you remember the first time you saw The Matrix? I mean, it seemed to blow the collective mind of humanity so profoundly that it never really left the zeitgeist. It certainly had me questioning my reality and captivated my imagination. I mean, I was ready to take the red pill, download Kung Fu, follow Morpheus into battle into a dystopian sans stake hellscape against our AI overlords, no questions asked. So yeah, simulation theory is an irresistible rabbit hole. It seduced everyone from semi-literate armchair stoner philosophers like myself to legitimately big brain scientists and everyone in between really. But aside from that, is it really likely? Is reality a simulation. By the way, my name is Michael Phillip. Thanks for wonder dipping with me today. Take a moment to tickle those algorithms for me by liking and subscribing, because as you know, those are the currencies in this layer of the simulation. Before we get into the three objections I've advertised, where did this idea that we live in a simulation really come from, and how did it enamor so many of us? Well, first of all, who knows how long people have been thinking this way. It could go back as far as our intellects do, questioning our reality. And then there's the Hindu idea of Maya, that our reality is illusory, that what we perceive with our senses is illusory. And that right there goes back thousands of years to the Rig Veda. Of course, we already talked about what really brought it into the zeitgeist for our generation, the Matrix, which by the way, is far from the first mainstream iteration of simulation theory. I mean, it's really a sci-fi mainstay, and who hasn't just naturally, intuitively questioned the nature of reality? But all of that aside, what about the big-brained folk? What was the catalyst to get them interested? What was the catalyst to get people like Elon Musk and Nobel Prize winners interested in simulation theory. The big catalyst seems to be the absolutely brilliant Oxford professor Nick Bostrom's simulation argument, which I'm just going to let him nutshell it in his own words. There is this article that I published back in 2003 presenting the simulation argument. This is an argument that tries to show that at least one of three propositions is true, although it doesn't tell us which of these three is first that almost all civilizations at our stage of technological development go extinct before they reach technological maturity. Uh, a second possibility is that there is a very strong convergence among all technologically mature civilizations in that they all lose interest in creating ancestor simulations, as I call them. These would be very detailed computer simulations of people like their historical forebears, detailed enough that the simulated people in the simulations would be conscious. So the second possibility is that they just lose interest in doing this. And the third possibility is that we are almost certainly living in a simulation. You can show that if the first two possibilities do not obtain, then there will be many, many more simulated people like us than there will be non-simulated people like us. In other words, almost all people with our kinds of experiences would be living inside simulations rather than outside them if the first two possibilities are false. And the conditional on that, we should therefore think we are probably one of the typical simulated people. Right? So some important takeaways from what Bostrom just said there. There's a difference between simulation argument and simulation hypothesis, or what we popularly call simulation theory. The simulation argument actually consists of those three possibilities Bostrom laid out. Possibility number three is actually what we call simulation theory or simulation hypothesis. So another important note, Bostrom himself is not saying we live in a simulation. He's saying that's one of three possibilities. Another catalyst I have to mention that gets a lot less love, but I think is incredibly interesting, comes via theoretical physicist James Gates. Gates is a professor of physics at Brown University who works on string theory, specifically superstring theory. And while working on the mathematics surrounding superstring theory, Gates found something incredibly odd, incredibly spooky. What he says is indistinguishable from error correcting computer code. The exact same string of binary we would use to ensure there aren't errors in data transmission. And this, of course, is mind blowing. I can't even imagine how spooky that discovery must have been, 
how many times he must have gone back and checked his work. But as Gates himself says in an interview, this actually being relevant to reality in any way is a long way off. Uh, in a nutshell, he says, until super string theory is proven to be scientific fact, until we can demonstrate through experimentation that it's real, all he's done is, quote, create a mathematical fairy tale. But as humble as that sounds, I want to be clear. I think Gates and Bostrom are absolutely geniuses of the highest order. And they might be onto something with both the simulation argument and with this error correcting computer code discovery. So with that, why am I saying simulation theory is probably wrong? Or more accurately, the simulation hypothesis is probably wrong. Let's get into the three reasons. I've really tried to construct these objections based on my own thoughts. So it's gonna be somewhat loose, somewhat riffy, but I think these three points are compelling. Objection number one, we can only think as far as our most advanced concepts. Of course, right now, the most advanced tools we have at our disposal are computers. Really, they run practically every aspect of our lives. The digital realm is completely enmeshed with the everyday. And as Bostrom pointed out, there's no denying it. We are making increasingly realistic computer simulations, and it won't be long until they're indistinguishable from reality graphically. So there's absolutely a resemblance between reality and simulations. But resemblance is not evidence. And to illustrate that, the human intellect has actually been down this rabbit hole before. Many minds, even some great ones, have posited that reality seems to be some kind of technology. Luminaries like Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes, for example, actually likened reality to a watch. Rene Descartes speculated that the cosmos was a great time machine operating according to fixed laws, a watch created and wound up by the great watchmaker. And this analogy is actually quite well established, so well established, in fact, that it has a name, the watchmaker analogy. It has a Wikipedia article. There are whole books written on it. And it makes sense, right? Particularly from the vantage point of the time it was written in. The cosmos does have clockwork-like functions planets and their orbits, the cyclical nature of seasons, even down to the atomic level, an atom with its protons, neutrons, and electrons does look like a kind of mechanistic clockwork. But does that mean reality is a watch? But again, from the vantage point of Rene Descartes' time, it seems a lot more plausible. A watch was the most advanced piece of tech they had, and its qualities mapped over reality pretty well. So coming back to modern day, our most advanced tech seems to map over reality pretty well. We do have super advanced simulations and VR and metaverse, but does that mean that's what reality is? No, because again, resemblance is not evidence. And I would even venture a guess that we're going to go down this same road again. We're going to invent some new technology and find, lo and behold, it seems to mirror reality. We're going to invent the Zorg lab, and you're going to think to yourself, oh, reality seems a lot like a Zorg lab. Are you in a Zorg lab right now? So that's what I mean when I say we can only think as far as our most advanced concept, or at the very least, we have a huge bias toward our most advanced concept. My second objection is pretty straightforward. If we wanted to actually answer the question of whether or not we live in a simulation, how would we do it? What experiments would we conduct? What variables would we test? And I'm sure you see where I'm going with this. We have no means by which to do any experimentation on the question. Really, when it comes to Nick Bostrom's entire simulation argument, we're dealing with a string of if-then statements, a logical thought experiment. And I think it's a good one, but ultimately it's not scientific. Right now, at least, it's just philosophical speculation, which, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, if I said I wasn't, I would be a huge hypocrite because I've spent well over 300 podcasts doing a whole lot of it. So because simulation hypothesis and really the whole 
simulation argument is not falsifiable, it's no better or worse than any reasonably well thought out philosophical speculation. Objection number three, simulated worlds do not contain consciousness. And I think this is my most vigorous objection to the whole simulation hypothesis and argument. The whole premise that this consciousness you and I are experiencing is something that could be simulated is something I take issue with. And to expand on that, while we are indeed creating more realistic simulations, they don't contain a shred of consciousness. You might be familiar with the famous statement put forth by the philosopher Thomas Nagel, if it's like something to be a bat, then a bat is conscious. If it's like something to be anything, then that thing is conscious. So let's try it out for the sake of a simulation. Is Mario conscious? Is Pikachu? How about my homie Solid Snake? Are you conscious? Please be conscious. I wish I could have a Pikachu be Solid Snake's best friend. If Mario wants to bring over some mushrooms, believe me, I am down. And to be fair, I am straw manning a little bit here because Bostrom does account for this in his argument. He does acknowledge that simulations now are not conscious. And he goes on to say that we would need to find a way to simulate down to the neuron level, that we must be able to simulate neurons and networks and informational complexity in order for there to be sentient beings within simulations. But that is a huge assumption. And I'm not talking about from the standpoint of computer processing. I'm talking about from the standpoint of consciousness itself. Specifically, what is consciousness itself? If you haven't gone down the consciousness rabbit hole, believe me, it's a deep one. And we do not have time to explore it thoroughly within the confines of this video. But to nutshell it, there is no consensus on what consciousness is or how it works. The most popular one, of course, is the materialist one, and that may square with Bostrom's argument. The story there would be consciousness somehow emerges when a brain gets sufficiently advanced, enough neuron density, gains certain features, all of a sudden out pops the ghost of your consciousness. Suddenly the rabbit of consciousness pops out of the hat that is the goo between your ears. But there are real issues with this explanation. Again, I definitely can't get into the nuances of all of those objections now, but as David Chalmers, one of the most popular philosophers of consciousness points out, there's an explanatory gap there. Science has yet to prove that you get this strange, rich, subjective experience we call consciousness from a brain alone. Clearly a brain is involved in the way that we perceive the world and ourselves, but is that where consciousness comes from? Is that where this movie experience that we're all having is coming from, from the brain alone? Well, as of now, we don't know. As of now, it's still a mystery. So why are we assuming a simulated brain would be able to make that happen. The evidence just is not there yet. And I personally don't think it will be. Like I said, incredibly nutshelled. This is a very, very deep topic. Uh, I would recommend starting with David Chalmers' TED talk on the subject if you wanna go a little deeper. So is it possible that simulated beings will eventually wake up? Maybe, but how? Will consciousness suddenly pop out of a computer when it has an advanced enough processor and consumes enough information and sufficiently models the detail of a human brain? In my view, probably not. So where does this leave us, my friends? Well, I think it leaves the whole simulation argument on some very shaky legs. That said, there is a huge twist here. I don't think we live in baseline reality. I do think reality has simulation-like qualities and that we do not perceive reality as it is at all. There are a lot of reasons for this. Again, I cannot get into them all in this video and I wanna leave you with a concrete wonder nugget illustrating that reality is not at all what it seems and it comes courtesy 
of one of my favorite contemporary thinkers, cognitive scientist and author of The Case Against Reality, Dr. Donald Hoffman. As Hoffman has famously argued, the chance that we perceive reality as it is with our senses is 0%. Zero. Hoffman believes that our senses have been shaped by natural selection not to perceive reality, but to survive. A little difficult to wrap your mind around at first, but here's an analogy that Hoffman often uses that's really going to bring us full circle with this video. Think in terms of your computer's desktop. When you click a folder on your desktop, is that folder really there? Is there really an object that looks like a folder? Not at all. It's layers of code, of software, of hardware, and all of those things manifest together to give the appearance of something that's friendly for the user to interact with. Meanwhile, you're completely cut off from the reality of all of the code that manifests as a folder. What we perceive with our senses works much in the same way, according to Hoffman. And I'm sure right now you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that sounds exactly like a simulation, Michael. Well, yes and no. Like I said, I do think reality has simulation-like properties, but it's not a simulation. To continue Hoffman's analogy, we don't know what the code is. We don't know what underpins the things we're sensing with our scientific instruments, with our senses. As I just pointed out, we don't even know what this thing we call consciousness is. We don't even know what this thing we perceive the world with is. All we know is that we're having this conscious experience. We can't penetrate it. So that's a mystery that I am centrally fascinated in. What is this subjective experience, this movie-like phenomenon that we're all co-experiencing? Is it just a manifestation of our incredibly complex neurology and biology? Maybe, but there's plenty of evidence and sound logic to suspect otherwise. So where does that leave us, my friends? Does it leave us in a simulation? Well, maybe of sorts, but I don't think it's the kind being generated by some hyper-powerful computer. I think it leaves us in a wonderful, boundless, sometimes vexing mystery. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know if you thought the objections I raised were good ones. If you completely disagree with me, I want to hear it all. This one was a lot of fun for me. Much love to you all, and we'll see you in the next Wonder Dip.